You guys, you need to pace yourself from all this excitement. 124 is the time you're getting out of here. 124. All right. So, uh, with that being said, uh, today we're going to talk about the trade perspective of personality. Uh, oh, also, uh, anybody that wants to get anything in prior to progress reports, I am available after school today. Uh, but yeah, today we're going to talk about the trait perspective of personality. We are going to talk about the social uh, cognitive perspective of personality on Tuesday. Uh, when we return, Wednesday, Thursday, talk about intelligence. Friday next week, we'll be here to the seven as all right. And uh, at the end of this period, I'm going to tell you guys what your assignment is uh, that will count as your assessment uh, for this particular unit. And uh, I'll let you know about that at the end. Okay, so any questions before we get started? I'm good, ready to roll? Cool enough. Okay, so uh, here's what we talked about with personality so far. We talked about uh, Freud and psychoanalysis. Everything is your past. You gotta go back and fix your past. And everything was based on sex. Even when you were three, you wanted something. So that was driving everything for us, even though we didn't know it. According to Freud, that battle of the id, ego, and superego was everything. That developed your personality. And we talked about the neo-Freudians, and then the neo-Freudians tell us, yeah, it's not all negative, uh, it's not all sexual, and plus we got a collective unconscious because all of us want to be loved, all of us want to heard, all of us want to get the best of you to become. Uh, some more than others. Uh, so that's sort of what drives us. Then we also look at humanistic, which goes back to that. We want to become the idealized version of ourselves. We get much past, but you can't fix your past. But you've got to figure out what is right for you. So that's all good there. And today we're going to talk about the trait perspective of personality. Now, when we talk about the trait perspective of personality, we got to talk about the guy who's largely looked at as responsible for this. His name is Gordon Allport. Now, all important in the early 20th century, around 1919 to be exact, uh, well, for this, because when he was interested in psychology, he decided, well, let's go talk to the guy who was getting the most pub in psychology at the time, and that was Sigmund Freud. All right, so he's going to go see Sigmund Freud because he wants to learn about psychology and personality and everything else, and he goes and he, uh, on his way to going to see Sigmund Freud, he takes a ferry. I think he went to Vienna, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I think he ferry across the river, across the lake, whatever, he's on a ferry. And when he's on this ferry, this boat going across this body of water, he looks across the way and he sees this little kid, 9, 10, 11 years of age. Well, maybe younger than that. But this this kid was sitting on this, uh, this bench next to his mother. Mom was reading the paper going about her day. And the little kid was just freaked out by everything. Anything that was touching his skin just felt weird by it. Brought his sleeves down, just didn't want to be touched. Strangers got close to him, got real nervous and everything else. This kid just didn't want to touch anything, didn't want to be touched, just seemed really, really anxious. And his mother's reaction to him was almost nothing. You know, Albert noticed mom's just sort of going about her day, really kind of ignoring the kid. Even though the kid seemed in distress, mom just sort of had and went through her particular day. Anyways, Alport gets off the boat, goes to see Freud, talks to Freud about this, or he talks, wants to talk to Freud about personality. Freud goes, well, how was your trip? And Alport goes, uh, it was fine. Interesting, interesting though. Let me, let me run this one by you. And he tells the story of the kid on the boat to Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud hears the story that Alport talks about, the little kid doesn't want to be touched, mom kind of ignored him and everything else. And upon finishing the story, Alport said to Freud, he goes, what do you think? I mean, what do you think was going on there? What do you think was going on with that kid? And Freud, without missing a beat, lowers his glasses, puffs on his cigar, looks up and goes, so, so the boy was you, no? And Alport's like, no, it was a kid on a boat. It's not me. I'm not projecting all my life. Stop peeling the onion. Because Freud was all about, no, no, you're projecting yourself on everyone else. Albert said, it's a kid on a boat that wasn't me. Leave my mom out of this. And Freud wouldn't let it go. 
So Alport leaves this meeting with Freud a little frustrated, and he goes, sometimes you are who you are. A banana's a banana. You know, Popeye, as Popeye would say, I am what I am. You know, you just are who you are. And when he started to look at Freud in the psychoanalysis, he goes, you're just looking for stuff. You're digging too deep. I mean, sometimes we are just who we are. What you see, folks, is what you get. So this becomes the trait personality, which basically says that your personality is self-reported. I ask you a bunch of questions about who you are. You answer the questions, and I tell you, here's your personality type. All right? It's for basic. It's for, I don't tell you how you got there. And I can't really tell you what to do with it, although I can't use it to predict what you're going to do. But I can't make you better, can't make you worse, can't tell you why, whatever. But you have a personality type. And this type will tell you exactly what your behavior is going to be or what your typical average behavior will be. Now, this is not new. This goes back to the Greeks. Plato, Aristotle, that whole gang, they had their whole idea of personality types. Greeks recognized four. You were either cheerful, depressed, unemotional, or irritable. Greeks sound like a lot of fun to be around. Uh, only one of those seem okay, but you know, that's kind of who you are. All right, so in order to figure out what your personality is, we got to look at the different factors of who you are. What factors make up your particular thing that I can go, this is your personality type, what are your traits? So uh, Hans and Sybil Isaac in 1990 basically go, well, let's put it on this sort of axis right here. You fall from introverted to extroverted and stable versus unstable. To be very clear about this, an introverted personality is someone who just doesn't really interact with others that much. An extroverted personality is someone who wants to be in front of everybody else, somewhat the life of the party. Now, where we sometimes get this mistaken is we assume that because someone is introverted, they're shy and they're insecure. That's why they're not sharing this. Are all introverted people shy and insecure? Mm -hmm. No, some introverted people are introverted and they don't want to talk to other people because they think other people are idiots. I really don't want to waste my time with other people. I'm not a bunch of morons. I don't want to get involved with that. Let me just say to myself. And extroverts on the other side, we think that extroverts are the life of the party and look at them in front of everybody that must be some confident. Are extroverted people the most confident people in the world all the time? No, sometimes they're so insecure, they're going, please look at me, tell me I'm okay. Say I'm all right. Please look at me and pay attention to me. Tell me I'm okay. And that's an extroverted personality, all right? So not necessarily always secure, but that's your one side of that or the other side. Now, stable versus unstable, a stable personality means that you're kind of the same no matter who you're around, you know, whether you're at work or whether you're with friends or whether you're with your family, your personality type stays pretty, pretty consistent versus unstable goes more that persona route of Carl Hume, which says, well, you know, I differently in front of my friends than I do in front of my family. But whatever, if I'm in a good mood, if I'm in a bad mood, you know, my personality sort of change. I'm hungry, I'm not hungry. That becomes an unstable personality. And again, harder to predict behavior because of that. So again, biological influences, extroverts seek stimulation because their normal brain arousal level is low. Okay, so I need that sort of stimulus. PET scans show that the frontal lobe of an introvert is much, much more active. What is everyone else going to think about this particular thing? Our culture can have an impact on this. If you're from an individualistic culture, you're more likely to be, not all the times, extroverted. Let me get some attention, whatever. Yet if you are from a collectivist culture, more likely to be a little bit introverted. So how do we find out what your personality type is? Well, we have you take a little test, folks. We're going to have you take a little test, answer a bunch of questions, true, false, agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree, whatever the case may be. So I ask you questions, do you usually value sentiment over logic or logic over sentiment or whatever, and you choose one of these. And then the more questions I ask you, the more accurate this test tends to be, not all the time, because I'm gonna, I, mean, I don't wanna just ask you two questions and go, this is who you are. Now, we also tend to agree with the results because we are aware of how we answer the results. So these tests can be very, very simple. You know, because we just spent five or 10 minutes answering a bunch of questions. So, you know, it says this is who I am. So it must be great. The other problem with the test, the test tends to be, and I think we talked about this before, incredibly positive. You know, when you go online and you take the test, which Disney princess are you? No matter how you answer it, you're a princess. So you're telling me that if serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer took this test, he's still a princess? Everybody's a princess. And then what happens, it becomes a little self-fulfilling is that we're 
whether we get the results and act that way, but sometimes we want certain results. So let's say I want to be a princess and I want to be a specific, I want to be the princess from Frozen. Who's Isa? Wilson, sorry. sorry. I've never seen Frozen. Sorry, I've never seen. I have two granddaughters. I'm sure I will soon. All right, but I haven't seen Frozen. So Elsa, she's the princess in Frozen. Okay. So if you ask me on a personality test, do I prefer warm weather or cold weather? Guess what I'm going to answer? I want to be Elsa. I'm going to answer cold. Might be true, might not be true, but that's what I'm going to answer. You know, if I'm taking a, you know, which star I want to be Han Solo, and I'm just going to, am I really answering what I, or am I answering Han? Because I never get Han Solo. But, I, but that's what I'm going to do. My wife took a, a personality test. We were having fun with it one day. And uh, she came back with Darth Vader. She was very upset. She was, I'm going to take it again. I go, and get a little Vader again. Uh, but she didn't want to believe it. So, and again, when do we take the test? When it comes to business. Businesses, especially if you're in sales. Sales uh, businesses want to know, are you a bull? These archetypes, are you a bull? Which means, go get her, forget if I'm screwing anybody else over, whatever. I got to get the sale. Al, you want to be wise, you want to do what's right, put people in the right place, whatever. I want to be a lamb. I just want others to like me, take care of others, or I'm a tiger. I've got my pride, so I get hit you when you don't know it. My wife took this test when she first got into sales. She was mostly owl, well, actually mostly lamb with a little bit of owl. Now she's mostly owl with some bull. Because this is, she's changed. She's changed since she's gotten in sales. But does this become a self-fulfilling prophecy where we go, well, I'm a bull. Screw everybody. I just got to do what I got to do. So that's the other seductive part of this test that can also lead to some inaccuracies. Now, the most famous of these tests and probably the most respected of these trait tests is the MMPI, the Minnesota Multifaceted Personality Inventory. Uh, this was originally used to develop to identify emotional disorders, uh, but it is now, and it's the most appropriate use, but now it's being used for screening processes, sometimes job uh, applications, sometimes, you know, what part of the business should you be put in, whatever. The MMPI, last time I checked, I think it's four to 500 true-false questions. You just answer true or false, and you have to do it a certain amount of time, so you're not thinking about it too much. And a lot of times, they give you the same question, but they sort of restate the question in a different way because they're looking for consistencies. They're looking for consistencies in these answers. And it's not guaranteed to be valid, but it's, it's guaranteed to give you an idea. And again, it's empirical because it's scored by a computer. I'm not, you know, Roshark going, what do you see in the same plot? And here's what I think. I'm not Freud coming to you and interpreting your journey with your mother to my journey with my mother. You know, I'm taking everybody's ego out of it. A computer literally spits back a number. This is who you are. No opinion is part of this. Now, with that being said, has anybody in here at any point gotten a job? And part of the job was you took a personality test. Did anybody have to take a personality test as part of an application for work? Nobody? Just a bunch of unemployed people? Well, no, I'm employed. You didn't have to take personality tests? No one's ever had to take a personality test before, or you applied for a job to take a personality test? Anybody had to do one for any other sort of situation you were applying for something, but they said, take this personality test? No one. Okay. It's actually good. It's actually good because a lot of companies are starting to require that people take personality tests. Can anybody see a problem with taking personality tests for a job? Try to do that best suit the job. That best suit the job, which, you know, it might be truthful on that. And again, when you ask a question like, have you ever stolen from work? I want this job. How am I going to answer that? No, oh, of course, it's stolen? No, but you took a pen home once. He took a pen home and didn't take it back. Is that technically stealing? Yes. But is that the same as taking $500 out of the drawer? No. So what is stealing? What are all these things? Now, I get it. I get companies that want to do personality tests. But we're going to start to see a little bit of a problem. Because most companies invest about 70% of their capital into human resources. So you want to make sure you're getting the best humans you can. Nothing wrong with that. I get that. I want to make sure that this, that's why we interview people. You know, that's why we, we ask them questions in interviews and everything else. So yeah, let's do a personality test and find out who they are and what they are. And if I can use the MMPI for that, that's great. Let's go back and look at what the MMPI measures. Originally developed to identify emotional disorders. Ah, so if I had you taken a personality test, 
it's going to be possibly exposed some stacks. Let me ask you this, folks. If I am your employer, I'm your future potential employer, can I not hire you because you have bipolar disorder? Can I? Can I? No. No, I can't. Can I not hire you because you have depression? Can I decide not to hire you because you have anxiety? Have any other type of schizophrenia, any other type of disorder? Is it legal for me to discriminate against you based on that mental, non typical mind? I can't, right? That's a violation. That is a violation of the 1990 Americans with Disability Act. Can't do that. But if I'm asking these questions about your mental, about who you are and your personality, is it possible that these questions could show me as your potential employer that you are susceptible to depression, that you are susceptible to anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever else, borderline, histrionic. I can see these things and I could go, well, this just raised some red flags for us. You're not a fit. But that's a way to discriminate, folks. It's an absolute way to discriminate against people in these particular tests. Most test takers have trouble answering the questions personally versus professionally. And the trick is, folks, most people who have depression, anxiety, bipolar, what those people tend OCD, they tend to be really good at compartmentalizing. You know, I'll do this, you know, in my own life, I might be a mess and at home, I might not be able to keep it. But when I'm at work, I can put all that to the side. And I can focus on things. So how am I answering this test? Am I answering it as the work me, as the personal me, as the romantic me? Which me? Because there's a lot of different me's, you know? And am I lying on these particular... And by the way, there's something to be said for lying on a personality test. It's not the worst thing in the world to do. I don't know how grade points work anymore. What's the highest grade point you can get now? Seven. Seven? Well, here. It's a seven now? Okay, I only understand four. I only said I only said I only understand zero to four. Four is an A, three is B, C on that. So let's say let's say that your actual grade point average is three point two, yet you say your grade point average is three point seven, which of course is a lie. You're like, you're great. But is that a terrible thing to do? Not all the time, because studies do show that if you overinflate your grade points on a personality test or whatever, it actually drives you to work up to that. You're putting out there an idealized version of yourself. So sometimes fibbing a little bit, saying that you weigh a little bit less drives you to go lose weight or whatever else the case may be. All right, now, if you take a personality test, if you're going to a job and you take a personality test and they say, sit here at a computer, and one of the questions is, will you give the computer's camera access? Do not give the computer camera access while you're taking a personality test. Why? Because guess what they're doing? They're reading your face. And what are they looking for? Micro expressions. And they're looking for micro expressions to see if you're doing what? Want to take a guess? Are you lying? Are you lying? Are you being truthful? Which you think they have the right to do. But if I'm interviewing someone for a job, would it be legal for me to hook them up to a lie detector machine while I interview? That's an illegal search. That was an illegal search. Employment Polygraph Protection Act, we actually have one of those, Employment Polygraph Protection Act of 1988, said that is an illegal search. You cannot, for someone's potential employment, hook them up to a lie detector, but that's doing it. So again, when we see so many people applying online, when we see so many people working from home, and that this, for a lot of people, is part of the hiring process, some people are being discriminated against, they don't know they're being discriminated against. Some people are being search they don't realize they're being searched they're just going along i mean target i mean of course target knows what they're doing they're a big business walmart's a huge business they know what they're doing and we just don't question but then when you have someone that's getting rejected job after job after job where everything seemed great until i took the personality test and you start to see a pattern and that's where you see lawsuits start to come into the equation because when we look at the mmpi i'm trying to get a job i see myself as someone who is depressed and blue be somewhat careless for his work that is routine and simple. I like to start quarrels with others. I can tell at any potential employer any truth to any of that. No. I ask questions like I am someone who is sometimes rude to others. I tend to be lazy. I tend to be disorganized. I can be moody. I can be cold and aloof. Questions like this. Uh, I see things or animals or people around me that others do not see. How do you ask someone that they're schizophrenic without asking you, are you schizophrenic? I ask you this question, and how you answer that is going to tell me something. And then it gets really peculiar on the grammar. 
that is used. This one right here still is bizarre to me. I loved my father. Why is it past tense? Is there something that happened? What if I still love my father? Is this false? I mean, what, what, it gets a little bit weird. And when we're taking it, and there's a timer, and there's a pressure, and all these other things, it can get a little bit confusing. Again, Trey, not terrible. It can be used for good things. Let's take Ed, for example. Ed had some issues with the law. So Ed has to go and do some rehab at some little clinic or whatever because Ed's got some problems. Because this right here is normal. If you fall from 40 to 60, this comes into normal or in the middle of that bell curve right there. But Ed scores significantly high when it comes to things like depression, when it comes to hysteria, when it comes to being overly masculine, paranoid, aggressive, uh, a little bit on... Uh, this one, anxiety right there as well. And then again, a little bit introverted and shy right there. He's off the normal scale. Well, let's treat Ed. We treat Ed and we put Ed through our program for six weeks, eight weeks, and then Ed comes back and takes another test. And would you look at this? After treatment, Ed comes into normal on everything. So can we say that our treatment worked? Maybe. But what else may have happened? Why? Why did Ed change his answers? He wants to get out. He wants to get out. Folks, how many times have you been in an argument? It's going nowhere. How many times have you said to someone, what do you want me to say that's going to make you happy? And you just say it. Do you mean it? Never. I just want the argument to end. Ed just wants to go home. He just wants to get out of the thing. And so sometimes you have the ability on a conscious level test to give them the answers that they want to hear. Now, there we go. Myers Briggs. How many of us in here, show of hands, you have taken online at some point some type of Myers Briggs test? Okay, I'm sure many of you guys have it tattooed on your shoulder or something because this is defining who you are as a person. Now I can be whatever. All right, let's take a look at Myers Briggs. Here's what it basically is for those of you guys not familiar with it. You take a test. It's so many questions, and then what it's going to spit out at you is four letters, okay? I take the Myers-Briggs test. I'm not saying these are my results. Uh, I take the Myers-Briggs test, and it comes back, and it tells me that I am, in fact, uh, let's just go E, N, F, J. All right, I'm an ENFJ. I come over here, ENFJ. I should be a teacher because I am an extrovert that, that uses intuition. I am a feeling person, and I'm very judging. All right, so these are the great qualifications to become a teacher because I have these four letters. That's who I am. Immediately. Anybody see a problem with this? You're an E. You're an N. You're an F. Check. We see a problem with that. It does limit you. But when I say you're an E, how E are you? How N are you? How F are you? When I'm just giving you these four letters, how much of it are you? For example, let's say that the middle is zero. Okay, let's put zero right there. Over here, we'll put positive 10. Over here, we'll put negative 10. All right, so here, here, positive 10. Positive 10. 10 over here, we got negative 10, negative 10, and negative 10. So the more the more here, the closer to the more negative, the closer to J T S E, the more positive, the closer to I N F O. So let's go back to when we were doing this in red. Let's say my extroversion score was a negative two. And let's say my intuition was a positive eight. And let's say that my feeling was a positive one, and let's say that my judging was a negative six. All right, now, if I took this test again, do you think it's possible or likely that my letters may change? That if I took it again, sure, because here's the trick, folks. If I take it again, if this is a negative two, we go plus or minus, is it possible that this negative two could become a plus one? Sure. Now, this plus eight, is that probably still going to stick with an N? Yeah, that's probably not going to vary because I'm a solid N. 
but now suddenly I become an I, and then this plus one on the feeling, is it possible that that could become now a negative two? So I'm over here. Now this, probably not gonna be enough to jump over there. I'm not gonna be able to jump that. So let's say this is still there. So now I'm an INTJ. So we come over here, I'm an INTJ. Well, suddenly, uh -huh, mastermind. All right, so now instead of being the teacher, I should be a mastermind. And I'm not sure how you apply for that job, but that's what I'm supposed to be now. So one of the problems is this, is there's no, you're, e you're either all this or you're not this. You're either this or you're that, okay? That's one big problem with this test. Another problem with the test is if we take a look at the history of who is Myers-Briggs, who are these people that came up with this? Well, Catherine Briggs is the mother of Isabella Myers-Briggs. And so the test is named after Isabella. Now, she had, uh, Catherine had three children, lost two. So now she's down to just Isabella. So she's very, very protective of Isabella in the early 20th century, around 19, oh, this is 30s, 40s, uh, at this particular point. So she's dedicating her life to studying her child, okay, and how her child's personality is, and also the friends of her children, and what type of personalities they have. And who best gets along with my daughter, doesn't get along with my daughter. Now, she doesn't have a formal education. Nothing wrong with that. Not a lot of women in the early 20th century were given the right to have a formal education. She was a huge fan of Carl Hume. Okay, good. Personas, different things. All right. And then she took what she learned about her daughter, and she kind of made it a little bit scientific, but not quite uh, more statistically accurate. Uh, and then what she did was she sold this to a lot of companies post-World War II because you have all these men coming home. What job do you give them? What job would be best? She felt that if people came like shoes with a label, you could avoid a painful fit. So this would put people into the right jobs. All right. All sounds good. So we get here. Catherine never copyrighted her letters. She never copyrighted Myers-Briggs. Immediately, what's the problem? This problem is not copyrighted. I can make a Myers Briggs test. If I can open up a website, I want to make a Myers Briggs test. I can make a Myers Briggs test and I can use these letters. So, again, when you're going on the internet, whose test is accurate because they, they can just come up with these letters? There's one problem. And also, every personality has a positive spin. No matter how you answer, you're a princess. No matter how you answer, you're a friend. No matter how you answer, you're some great character from Phineas and Ferb. No matter how it is, you're still, I'm still in the show. No matter how I answer these questions. So it has an unbelievably positive spin. Also, she said that people with IQs under 100 shouldn't be tested because they didn't have the cognitive ability to be able to say what their personality type is. Well, now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Also, she had separate standards for men and women, sexes. She wrote some racist novels in her past. Well, we can kind of let that go. But social media pop culture has taken this, and again, it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy that a lot of people don't know their social security number, but they know their four letters. They know these four letters. And then they go to TikTok, and they watch other videos, and they go, well, I'm an ISTJ, and you best get along. And it almost becomes astrology at this point. So there starts to be some problems with this test and how it's basically been manipulated by pop culture and whatnot. So when it comes to a better type of personality test, we take a look at what is called the big five. The big five personality test, which you can also look at as ocean or canoe if you want to rearrange it, is a test that it doesn't give you a set of letters, of absolute letters, it gives you a spectrum of where you fall on these five characteristics. How open are you? How conscientious are you? How extroverted are you? Agreeable and neurotic. So all of us are an O, just how much O. All of us have a C, just how much. E, just how much. A, just how much. And N, just how much. Now, one of the other problems with the personality test is that people want to have the best personality. What is the best personality? Well, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better if you were someone who was more agreeable? Wouldn't it agreeable be a strong, good, shouldn't? We should all want to be agreeable, right? Folks, is it always great to be agreeable? No. If you're always agreeable, you're sending your checks to some Nigerian prince 
uh, to free a princess and oh, you'll get all your money back soon. Just give me your credit card and check your account number. And you no, know, you have no money. You have no money. There is no best personality. Again, high levels of agreeableness correlate with negative financial outcomes or negotiating skills. You know, sometimes some what we look at as maybe bad traits are actually beneficial in certain little uh, areas or little places. So again, where do you fall? It's okay to be a little bit neurotic. You don't want to trust everything. You know, so it's it, there's these different levels. So this is this is a little bit more accepted. This is looked at as yes, everybody is this. You're not an absolute this versus an absolute that. So this tends to be in most uh, psychological practices a better way to look at people's personality, more based specifically on uh, the MMPI, and also it's all you know copyrighted. It's more scientific than Myers-Briggs is, okay? All right, so with that being said, evaluating the trait personality. First off, how stable is your personality? Situational influences are gonna affect your personality, folks. Are we a little bit different when we're tired? A little bit different when we're hungry? A little bit different when we get back a good test score versus a bad test score? Okay, so there's gonna be varieties, and a lot of studies show, especially when it comes to Myers-Briggs, you take it two, three weeks later, there's gonna be a pretty big difference. So what these tests are looking for is your average behavior, your typical behavior, because what we're trying to do is predict your future behavior. And again, trait doesn't tell you how you got there. It's just somewhat of a predictor of what you're going to become. Now, again, the big critics of this will go, it's easy to fake your answers. You know, I'm gonna come up with the idealized version of myself. All The only person I'm asking here is my ego, not my id. Not my super ego. It's just my ego. And my ego wants to put out the best version of me. You know, all of my friends are coming up with these letters. How do I come up with these letters? You know, and again, like we talked about with Hume, which persona is being measured? There's your working personality, your friend personality, your student, your partner, whatever. And here's another tricky thing. If you want to have fun with the little Myers-Briggs test, something you can do, you take the test, then have one of your friends take it, as if they were answering the way they think you would answer. And do your letters match up? You know, that's where we start to see any sort of consistent. There's who I am, what I put out there, and everything else. It can be a little bit different. When my wife was going to interview for this one particular job, uh, they asked her uh, that they wanted to ask her to take personality tests, but they also wanted me to take personality tests for her, uh, which I don't think would be right. It would be better for one of the customers to take it. Uh, to take it. But whatever. So there can be some criticisms of this, all right? Any questions on that? Or I'll tell you what your assignment is? No. All right, so I just spent about 15 minutes slamming Myers-Briggs. So here's your assignment. You're gonna take a couple of Myers-Briggs tests. All right, I'm gonna have you take a couple of these. Now just hear me out. Let me walk you through what I'm gonna ask you to do here. I'm gonna walk you through what I'm gonna ask you to do and then you can get started on it because we're not out of here. For another 12 minutes or so, so you can at least take one of these. All right, take any two Myers Briggs tests, okay? Anything that claims to be a Myers Briggs test. You can go to the App Store and you can download an app if you want to. You can go to Google, type in Myers Briggs, take one of those, 16personalities.com. That's an easy one to go to. So I want you to take two of them. And then I want you to know what your four letters are. I know some tests will give you four letters, dash one, and I don't care about the dash one. Just your four letters. Come up with your four letters on two different tests, all right? Then what you're gonna do, you're gonna go to Schoology, click on the class, come down to the third, uh, this right here, go to this red folder, okay? And you're gonna go to this right here, which says Myers-Briggs Personality Tests, all right? And there's gonna be, 11 questions here really easy this is this is softball big time questions what were the four letters you came up with on your first test what were the four letters that you came up with your second test why do you think they stay the same or varied in taking those tests and which of these tests you feel is more accurate to your own personality test okay now that gets you through the first four questions when we start with number five you're going to choose one of the two and if they were the same great you're going to choose one of the sets of four letters folks for questions five six seven eight nine and 10. I'm asking you to list your personality type, list your four letters before you answer the question. So here are my four letters, now let me answer the question. Because I grade these one question at a time. I'm not gonna remember what your four letters are from 
20 people in color. Okay, so keep repeating your four letters at each one of these. Then I'm going to ask you to go to a slide. Go to the slide in the PowerPoint. Slide is available right here. This is where it says AP site unit simply four five six and do Myers Briggs, which is this right over here. Okay, so this is your PowerPoint here. Click on right there. Uh, beginning. Okay, so this is just a little thing right there. That's your assignment right there. And this will tell you a little bit about what each of those letters mean, what percentage of the population tends to have each of those particular letters. And then this right here is a breakdown of where your personality falls with the general population of the United States. Now, if, if we divide 100 by 16, that comes out to six and a half. So if your personality type is greater than six and a half, it's a more common personality. If it's less than six and a half, it's a rarer personality. There's a difference between the male and the female population. So you're going to look at that slide of do you have a unique uh, or a rare personality versus a common personality. And by the way, folks, a unique personality isn't always a great thing. Because sometimes when you have a very rare personality, sometimes it's hard for you to interact with others. All right. And then what you're going to do is you're going to come across a slide, which is your four letters. Let's just stop right here. All right. And let's say your letters are ENFJ. All right, so then you're going to go to this particular slide where ENFJ is. It'll give you a little breakdown of the personality. It'll give you job possibilities of it. And then it will tell you what characters are you like. You, if you're an ENFJ, you're like Barack Obama. You're like Padme. You're like Nelly from The Office. You are like Wonder Woman from DC. You're Marvel characters, Disney characters, animals, how you love, which Muppet are you, which uh, Hunger Games. Game of Thrones, all these other videos and for which little pony you are. Uh, all these different things are here, okay? So you're going to use this to go through and answer the next few questions. Which of these surprised you that you were like? Which of them uh, that did you not disagree with, agree with, whatever? Those are going to be those questions there. Now, here's the trick, because this is where it starts to get screwed up a little bit. The question becomes, did Barack Obama ever take the Myers-Briggs test? Probably not. And I'm sure he didn't publish his results. Did Wonder Woman ever take the Myers? She's a fictional character. No, she didn't. Kermit the Frog, well, actually, the scooter right there, never took the Myers. So again, this is someone's opinion of what the test would be. With what, when someone says, oh, you're an EFJ, you're the carrot cake of dessert, there's no way to possibly scientifically say that carrot cake has the same personality as Ronald Reagan, although that's interesting. But there's no way that you can do that. So again, you gotta kind of resist the pop culture-y part of it, but it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to look at that as well. All right, so you're gonna go through, you're gonna answer those 11 questions. That's your assignment. That's due Tuesday at midnight, okay? So if you can knock some of it out now, you guys know you can go back and forth to it. Uh, submit it by midnight on Tuesday. Any questions on what we did here? Okay. Have a wonderful weekend. You got about, uh, you got about uh, seven or so minutes. If you want to knock one of these tests out, you can't. All right. And once you get your two sets of four letters, it should be pretty easy for you to do it.